Hello, dear students. Now we are going through uh, the lecture uh, number one, L01, uh, in the Introduction to Project Management course. Well, there is the abbreviation PSO, which uh, refers to the Finnish language version of this uh, course. And uh, the title of uh, this lecture is uh, now uh, here uh, in these three uh, concepts. Well, introduction, that includes a lot of issues that I want to discuss you about. Uh, it's a kind of a very many introductory uh, things uh, connected to this course. And then uh, we are going to talk about project business and towards the end of uh, the uh, lecture uh, we are talking about project marketing and sales. Um, to motivate you uh, about uh, this lecture, this slide now uh, uh, describes uh, the textbook chapters and uh, uh, lecture videos uh, that are connected to this content that I'm going to lecture here. And uh, I would say that this L01 uh, lecture one uh, now uh, supports your studying uh, in the, uh, of these parts of uh, the course, uh, these book chapters and these videos. And also uh, uh, here we present in this slide uh, also the connectedness uh, of this con lecture, lectured content to the uh, uh, self-study lesson exercises uh, uh, that are available in uh, our uh, learning environment, my courses. Uh, then, um, when it comes uh, to your first uh, group assignment, so uh, I would say that uh, uh, textbook chapter 3 and those videos that are connected to this chapter 3 uh, are relevant and uh, I would say maybe almost only that you need uh, when you are uh, diving into your first group assignment. Okay, well, uh, the contents of, of this uh, lecture are the following. So, uh, first about project business, then uh, we are talking about the core of managing projects. And the core of managing project is conducting management actions and making decisions continuously during the project execution. That is, that is important and I try to uh, explain you uh, what that includes and, and, and why. Then keeping your eyes fixed in the future uh, at the point of time at completion of the project. That, that, that is uh, important to understand and that we are not looking uh, on the rear view mirror uh, when we are managing projects. We are continuously uh, keeping our eyes uh, uh, in, in the future towards the end of the project and further. And uh, I'm going to uh, explain this also by uh, giving you an example about deviation reporting. So deviation, but deviation about what? Then uh, time and time factor in management of projects, that is important. Already here we have been talking about uh, different dimensions of time when we are talking about uh, making uh, something towards the future in projects which is not yet but only at the completion of the project but there are other time related uh, uh, aspects as well i think that you will find them out when we go on uh, 
the, in, into this lecture content and also in, in, in the uh, next lectures L02, L03 and, and, and so on. So uh, then project marketing and sales and uh, it's rather important also to um, uh, take up the buyers uh, or uh, uh, buying projects view. Uh, so buying project and sub project is, is rather important because the seller is very dependent on the actions of uh, the buyer. So uh, actually the selling process is uh, rather much controlled uh, about the buyer's buying process. So uh, that, that, that is what we must understand, the uh, other side of the coin, the buying as well, when we are talking about project marketing and sales. Then um, I'm going to talk about risk, actually the concept of risk. And I need to talk this to you uh, because I'm going to emphasize uh, that uh, the fact that in project management uh, the risk is not only unfavorable but it is also favorable thing. It is a favorable event too. It can be a favorable event and that is very important that we understand the potential opportunities and how we take them into account into management. That the surprises are not only uh, uh, unfavorable surprises that we must uh, hedge against, but uh, they may be uh, also favorable events that we need to take advantage of. Uh, so um, contracts and contract types, and uh, we are going to discuss uh, about contracts as vehicles for transferring risks between the buyer and seller. And when we are talking about transferring risks, we are talking about transferring responsibilities. And when risk is not necessarily as a concept, it is not a kind of an unfavorable thing. It is uh, uh, f the fact that uh, it might be that, for example, a contractor that is transferred some risk uh, takes that uh, uh, with pleasure because the contractor can uh, make profit by taking the responsibility of certain project and uh, inherent risks. And in that way, uh, the contractor, of course, has uh, priced uh, its delivery so that uh, they make profit and also, uh, also they know what they do and uh, they can manage uh, the risks that are inherent in that work that uh, is contracted to them. Okay, there we needed the understanding of this risk concept of not being only unfavorable. Okay, uh, now uh, when we have uh, gone through uh, these uh, uh, items of this uh, lecture that we are going to discuss, uh, I show you this slide which uh, has uh, the same uh, main rubrics and then there are these uh, sub uh, bullets uh, that uh, are opening uh, the uh, themes uh, in a way that I did also orally here with you with this flipboard. So I don't go, I, I'm not going to start lecturing uh, about this uh, uh, content uh, slide. You can look that for a while or you can then stop the lecture video and, uh, and, and read what uh, we have been written in those uh, sub bullets but uh, for your knowledge that there is a more detailed uh, itemization of, of, of this thing that is in the flipboard now. Okay, now successful projects. In this course we are going to learn how to make this project successful. But of course we must understand that uh, uh, projects are unique and it is challenging, uh, challenging to uh, achieve uh, all the benefits or value increase that we are uh, uh, pursuing uh, towards in, in the beginning of the project. And uh, of course that also many times means that uh, the projects might not be successful uh, 
uh, in terms of all parameters. So it might be that some projects might cost more, but uh, still uh, the uh, end product of the project is uh, uh, rather uh, well successful and uh, value enhancing uh, uh, system uh, that was worthwhile to do even with higher cost. Um, at the top row of uh, this picture, uh, so uh, uh, there are the mobile phone models, also the Nokia's uh, uh, mobile phone from uh, uh, 2000, around 2000, I think, that uh, made uh, uh, or increased a lot of wealth. I mean, the Nokia increased a lot of uh, wealth as a mobile phone uh, uh, manufacturer uh, to, to Finland uh, at that time. Then there are these, uh, uh, well, sustainable uh, energy type of a projects, uh, solar power plants, uh, uh, wind mill parks uh, that uh, are rather well uh, up, to, up to date and, 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 and relevant for, for uh, the uh, long term sustainability and, 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 and uh, for green energy that we are uh, trying to pro produce. So if you run these kinds of a project, so uh, so we get understanding in this course how to uh, manage uh, them. Then uh, uh, at the uh, left bottom there is uh, the Finnish ice hockey team's uh, uh, gold medal in Olympics in uh, 1922. That was also a project, it can be considered a project of rather uh, several parties participating and uh, that, need, that needed to be orchestrated for uh, this gold medal. Uh, also uh, at the bottom row, uh, the healthcare system, healthcare renewal, uh, which is rather uh, up-to-date uh, thing. Uh, there is a kind of a, a computer screen with a, a patient card. Uh, up on the screen uh, symbolizing this health these healthcare projects then uh, also uh, these uh, metro lines like for example the western metro in helsinki uh, uh jokeri in in helsinki uh, very uh, important projects uh, that are built and uh, in that way uh, successfully uh, bringing value for uh, the capital of Helsinki transport, transportation. Um, then some artistic projects, like uh, in the uh, bottom uh, right bottom corner, there is the uh, Guggenheim Museum in uh, Bilbao uh, in Spain, <coughs> and uh, and uh, Guggenheim Museum was opened in 1997, a long time ago. And uh, the uh, Basque government uh, decided to invest $100 million uh, to build that museum that was designed by the famous architect Frank Gehry. And uh, uh, also the Basque government uh, paid to Guggenheim Foundation some, some uh, yearly uh, fees to uh, run and uh, circulate the ex exhibitions in, in that museum. So, uh, in three years, four million uh, uh, visitors were uh, coming to Guggenheim Museum and they increased uh, the economic activity in that area uh, with about $500 million uh, and uh, increased the tax income with some $100 million. So, in a way, this Guggenheim uh, Museum uh, was paid back in, in, in three years' time. Um, then there is the Sibelius Monument, uh, which was uh, uh, designed and constructed by the uh, sculptural uh, Eila Hiltunen, uh, which was uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, completed in uh, 
1967. And uh, now very many tourists are uh, taken there to see this kind of a, a great, magnificent uh, art piece. However, uh, when Eila Hiltunen designed uh, this and when it was uh, kind of a, uh, exposed uh, to public, so uh, she get a lot of hatred uh, from Finnish citizens so that, uh, that, that thought that this is a kind of a very shame to uh, uh, make this kind of a symbolic uh, uh, statue uh, about uh, this our uh, national composer Sibelius and uh, uh, Eila Hiltonen had to uh, uh, move to uh, Italy and, and live there for several years or several decades because of of this. However, now later uh, it is a very successful uh, art piece and, uh, and uh, very many uh, uh, people want to see it and Eila Hiltonen as a project manager did know what she did and she didn't very much uh, care at that time when making it about uh, the uh, uh, stakeholders that were kind of opposing uh, her artwork. Well, uh, then there in the middle, to the left, uh, there is your uh, uh, degree. And uh, that is really a project. Uh, you must orchestrate several, uh, uh, let's say, people and even organizations for your uh, degree, uh, your friends, your uh, uh, colleagues, student colleagues, your families, and also uh, the university, uh, who, which is dedicated to uh, produce uh, the courses for you, and also some uh, maybe financing institutions that uh, give financing for your studying and, and, and so on. So a real project also uh, that in your personal life. Also your sports uh, hobby, badminton, football, uh, uh, th th they are also projects when you are participating, for example, to some local championships and, and so on. So there are many, very many uh, individuals and, uh, and, and organizations that you must orchestrate for uh, uh, participating and wi maybe winning uh, in, in, in those areas. Okay, the big thing here uh, is, and it comes also uh, from all of these stories and, and not only the Guggenheim and, and Eila Hiltonen uh, story, that uh, uh, the projects have long-term value creation, value creating implications uh, uh, after the uh, project is completed and over. So, uh, so uh, the project changes the world uh, forever. I, I would say whether that would be your master's degree or whether that only would be your own family house that you built. So your life will be uh, different uh, afterwards after the project. Okay, uh, let's talk now about project business. And uh, I'm going to uh, talk about that with the following slide. I illustrate in this slide, uh, in the left side uh, of the bottom, uh, there is a kind of a, there's firm uh, described by a triangle. And uh, there are projects as circles or bubbles in uh, the firm's uh, organizational hierarchy. And uh, to the right, there is the project, a kind of a big uh, circle. And then firms are these triangles that are described as resources uh, for the project. Okay, and now we have this three uh, questions. Uh, where does the business content reside? Okay, when we are talking about the business content uh, of a project, so uh, I would say that 
the project is a purposeful thing. It was initially established for purpose. It makes something new, it makes innovation or it solves a problem. Uh, and uh, I think uh, that it, uh, in this way it uh, increases value and uh, it is uh, uh, kind of uh, beneficial in terms of uh, business of its own. And uh, I think that that is enough to define that why there is business content also in projects and not only in firms. Well, uh, the project strategy then. So, uh, what is uh, actually uh, strategy? Uh, well, uh, strategy, uh, the, the general definition of uh, strategy is that it uh, involves setting goals and priorities uh, and it is about determining act actions to achieve the goals. So we are talking about goals and, uh, and actions and uh, selecting of goals and actions and, and deciding about them. Well, my uh, argument is that uh, a project always has a strategy of its own. And it is different from uh, the firm's strategy. And um, uh, the project uh, strategy, for example, also if we take this left side picture where the firm, uh, the project is uh, in the hierarchy of a firm, the strategy of a project there can be to be the obedient servant of uh, the host organization. That is one kind of a strategy. Another project can be an independent innovator, which uh, develops something new, some new products, some new business ideas and so on, that are in contrast with the firm's strategy. And when we come back in the project portfolio management uh, theme uh, in uh, uh, the last lecture, LO5, uh, uh, so uh, we will learn that uh, the right way to react to uh, the con contrasting uh, strategies between projects and uh, firms is not necessarily to kind of uh, uh, kill the project or remove the project, but it might be that uh, the firm could or should maybe renew its strategy according to uh, what the project suggests. Well, then it is also uh, so that uh, uh, it is not always that a project has a clear one host organization, that it, but it can be that uh, the project has uh, several uh, strong um, hosting stakeholders. Like for example, if a project uh, develops a library uh, system, uh, li library information system for uh, uh, several cities in the metropolitan area of Helsinki, for example, Helsinki, Espoo and Vantaa. So it can be that all these cities as hosts for the project uh, have very strong and contrasting uh, uh, objectives uh, regarding uh, what uh, the system would be. And in that sense it can be that the project takes the lead and the project is the strong leader that uh, uh, need, uh, understands that whose, which cities, uh, let's say, desires uh, we should kind of block or ignore and what compromises we might need to make or should we make compromises at all or just do uh, the best solution that none of these uh, three cities actually is initially suggesting and so on. So uh, the project here when we are discussing the project as this kind of active, um, let's say, uh, strategic decision makers even. So uh, the perspective to projects is that a project is an 
autonomous temporary organization. So project as a temporary organization in this discussion that we have now. Also, what I want uh, still to uh, say about this picture, this kind of a right side picture where uh, the firms are participating to projects, to one project, uh, I would underline the fact that uh, contracts are important and also project marketing and selling and project buying or sub project buying is important here. Uh, so, because we have several firms, so how else we could connect them uh, and organize them as a project organization than through contracts. Okay, good. Uh, if you want, uh, you can check uh, this uh, video uh, about uh, project business framework. Uh, in your course material, uh, in uh, the lecture videos, there is the video with the name What is Project Business? Uh, that video also explains this project business framework, but uh, this uh, kind of a later made and shorter video uh, takes a very explicit uh, uh, angle of looking uh, the framework as an analysis tool. Uh, that could help you to analyze your project, your firm and its uh, business environment and the connection to other uh, parties like uh, 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 the, taking the project network view or a business network view by taking several uh, actors on, or, or stakeholders uh, into the picture around your project or firm. Okay. Uh, now, I want to move uh, to discussing about project success, project goal and project objectives. When I have asked you students uh, in a class uh, that uh, when a completed project can be considered being successful, so afterwards, when a project can be measured to be successful. So I have got answers uh, that, uh, okay, uh, when the project has uh, 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 responded to the uh, original target and achieved uh, the uh, result that was originally planned. And then there were, uh, well, comments about the time and cost. But then also, uh, much broader uh, aspects, for example, that uh, when we have learned something in a project, or when the customer is satisfied, or when the project team is satisfied, or when we have been able to sell uh, the project or solution to a customer, and uh, we have got ourselves into a certain market through having that uh, lead customer uh, to work with us and maybe give us some innovative ideas about customer's perspective, about our deliveries and, and so on. And then if we have made a successful product delivery and we have got uh, very good references and then uh, that helps us to make further business with this same customer or other customers because of this. Uh, good reference. Now, when we were talking about success criteria, so afterwards, what were uh, the successful uh, 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 the, the, the things that made the project successful, we are talking about project goal, which is a kind of a higher level goal, which we must always have in mind when we are managing the project, why we are doing the project. And the project uh, goal is always connected to a change. The project changes something. Okay. And uh, now in this uh, slide, uh, we have a, a, a line uh, that says that project objectives, uh, they 
are in the management focus, however. They must be in the management focus. The goals, the higher level goals are there and we are kind of a, uh, taking the project towards those goals. Also uh, in, uh, to bring value uh, at the time uh, after the completion of the project. But uh, we must concentrate on uh, the three uh, central project objectives of scope, time and cost. And with scope I use uh, the project end product as a synonym for the scope. And I think that that is rather concrete uh, way of also expressing uh, what comes out from the project. And the project end product is not only a physical product or a functional product, but uh, it also, this concept includes the qualities, the characteristics of that uh, product. So, for example, if we make an energy system, so a kind of a energy eff uh, effectiveness of producing uh, the energy is important. Uh, maybe the sustainability is an important quality that we want to have uh, out from the project. Also the ex during the execution, but also after the project, that the system uh, will be uh, uh, kind of a, uh, in, in a way, a responsible system uh, that uh, supports sustainability goals all the world. And uh, also uh, uh, there might be uh, aesthetic uh, qualities of the product, uh, project product and so on. So uh, the project end product can be material or it can be in material. It can be, for example, an organizational change or something. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's important to understand that uh, what, what the scope and uh, end product includes. Then, of course, time. We must do uh, that uh, uh, in, in certain time frame uh, and uh, the cost uh, we must uh, uh, do that uh, on a predetermined cost or resources. So these are three objectives that are uh, important. And because they are connected uh, in a tri triangle uh, and uh, they are in the corners of the triangle, that also symbolizes that we cannot change one without changing another or others. So if we, for example, well, let, let's take first this animation here. We, I have here uh, these uh, uh, arrows that we would like, of course, to reduce time. Uh, we would also like to uh, cut costs or reduce, reduce costs as well. And uh, of course, our uh, interest is to kind of uh, increase or maximize the scope or uh, end product and its qualities. Uh, but because these uh, three uh, objectives are connected, we cannot do one without uh, uh, changing others or another. So if we want to have a, a better end product, we must probably use more time and more cost on that. If we want to do it in a shorter time, so probably we must increase cost for accelerating uh, the project and so on. Now I'm moving to the discussion about the core of managing projects. And the core of managing project is conducting management actions and making decisions continuously during the project. And the project manager will face continuously unexpected events or surprising situations. And therefore, the project manager must be capable of acting fast. Acting fast in prioritizing between different project objectives and acting fast in making trade-off decisions between objectives. And uh, 
That doesn't mean that plans would not be important. On the contrary, plans are very important. But because there will be these kinds of uh, uh, unexpected events and uh, surprising situations and uh, that need uh, fast decisions, so uh, the project manager must understand which of the objectives uh, is more important than others. What is the order of importance of these objectives? And in that situation, when the project manager has to do the decision fast, so uh, th there is no time or no room to start analyzing for week or weeks that uh, what is the situation and what what we should do. But uh, the decisions must be kind of made fast to uh, make the project uh, proceed in a rhythmic way and not kind of getting clogged. Uh, uh, with uh, any any, any uh, these kind of a situations that we are facing. Okay. Now I have this same triangle, uh, objective triangle here in this picture, and I use it now to illustrate uh, the importance of the order of these objectives in decision making situations during projects. Uh, and I use it by uh, uh, describing uh, it as a position that we take that uh, has a distance to different uh, objectives. For example, if we would position ourselves uh, in this corner, it means that the time objective is the closest and that means that the time objective is most important in decision making. And then comes the two others. But uh, because we must have a clear order of importance, we cannot position ourselves in this corner because, okay, time would be the most important, but then the scope and cost objectives would be uh, of equal uh, uh, well, well, uh, distances uh, from, from this corner. And that would say that, okay, that is not our way to think, what, but we must have a clear order, uh, which is the first, which is the second one, which is the third one in uh, order of importance. Okay, we cannot position ourselves neither to this scope corner, because then time and cost would have uh, be, uh, an equal distance from this corner, and we cannot be here either in the cost corner. We cannot be in the middle because then all objectives would be uh, of uh, equal distance from, from this center area. And uh, we cannot be in this area because then time and scope would uh, be of equal importance uh, from, from there. For the same reason these uh, areas are out of question. Then we have only few white areas left where we can position ourselves in those situations in certain projects that we make decisions. If we are in this uh, point A, if we position uh, ourselves uh, here, one example could be that we are building an oil rig, which is a multi-billion uh, euro investment. And uh, uh, it is manufactured in the yard and uh, we can uh, take it out to the uh, North Sea only in uh, one month's uh, time range, uh, which is typically uh, the non-stormy uh, uh, time uh, in uh, July. And uh, that, that means that when we are closer uh, towards the end of this project, uh, we cannot uh, afford to wait for uh, the next summer. So we must uh, consider the time as most important to make it complete and uh, take it out to the sea in this coming summer's uh, July month. And uh, of course, the scope is important because it must be a kind of a working vehicle 
in in many ways and uh, and, and 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 the qualities uh, product qualities they're important but then cost probably is not very important so we must accelerate uh, the work uh, project work to make it uh, uh, to be uh, ready for production start uh, this uh, this year's uh, uh, July month okay then uh, an example of a project in this uh, area or this uh, uh, position B that could be a new mobile phone model of course uh, we must get uh, the fo uh, mobile phone uh, uh, to the market early but uh, the most important thing is that it is a kind of a working uh, phone uh, well working phone uh, with no uh, uh, problems or or, or uh, in, in, in its kind of a uh, Te te technical or uh, well lo logical user interfaces and so on so uh, the scope is most important of course but then comes the time because we want to have it uh, to market early before uh, competitors so time to market and again the cost might not be that important when we need to make those deci important decisions then we have this uh, point C, building of a house. The building construction is a very cost competitive area. And uh, of course, uh, when the customers are kind of pushing the price down, then the con uh, co uh, contractors uh, are considering the cost as rather important in their decision making. Uh, then time maybe next, because there are uh, uh, quite huge penalties for delays that the customers have set in contracts and then uh, unfortunately uh, the quality of the end product uh, is maybe then uh, compromised uh, uh, for these two aims and uh, the quality might not be sufficient so so maybe the uh, end product is the kind of a third and, and least important uh, objective then in decision making. Uh, point D, uh, uh, the family holiday uh, of a certain uh, winter holiday week and when we have started in our family preparing that rather late then the time is most important to have that specifically in that specific week then cost maybe that is rather important uh, because we cannot ga uh, pay what, 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 whatever sum for our holiday. But then uh, the scope to where we would travel, whether that would be in Europe or Asia or, or somewhere else, so that might not be that important because we must uh, kind of make trade-offs uh, about what are the options to decide about and, uh, and, and, and then uh, to have really this holiday and that specific week and, uh, and with reasonable cost. Okay, uh, then this point E, uh, it, uh, one example could be uh, the Concorde uh, uh, supersonic uh, passenger plane that uh, was uh, uh, having its virgin first Virgin flight in 1970s and uh, uh, that was really a kind of a technically uh, rather uh, complex uh, plane, uh, kind of a flying uh, gasoline tank in a way and the gasoline was pumped uh, around uh, the plane depending on how uh, full or empty the gasoline tanks, tanks were to give, uh, keep the plane st stable. stable. Uh, and also uh, when uh, that was kind of a, uh, taken into use uh, in the era of oil crisis in the 1970s, then uh, that was also rather important thing that uh, 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 brought the cost issues in. 
so of course the scope most important uh, okay supersonic uh, passenger plane that uh, flies and and it works then the cost issue but then it took a lot of time uh, to uh, uh, build and also when it was completed they were starting a kind of a new engine uh, models that would uh, kind of uh, be more uh, let's say uh, gasoline friendly in a, in a way and, and, and not consuming so much. Well, uh, if uh, I could take uh, this uh, Lancy Metro, uh, Western Metro project, uh, the first phase of it from Helsinki to Espoo to, Mat uh, to, to Matinkylä uh, uh, that was completed in 2017. So, uh, there were a lot of cost pressures uh, because the originally uh, informed uh, budget uh, was kind of a doubled or three doubled. Uh, and uh, the scope, of course, was the next because uh, they were wa they wanted to build a very safe uh, uh, metro line and, and the safety was uh, the kind of a first thing there. And, uh, and, and it required a lot of uh, investments. However, uh, some of uh, the originally planned features were kind of uh, uh, let, let go because of uh, the cost savings and, and, and so on. So maybe the project end product was a little bit compromised uh, against the cost. And uh, then the time uh, it was delayed a lot and uh, and and uh, there were rather many problems uh, when uh, the production or the traveling with this metro line could be started because of these problems that I explained. Now when uh, I was uh, talking about uh, your uh, 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 thesis project or, 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 or your uh, kind of a, uh, uh, education uh, as, as a project and, and when, you are, when you are making your degree. Uh, so where would you put or position, how you, would you position your degree uh, in uh, this uh, triangle? So is the time important? Do you want to make your degree fast? Uh, is the scope important? Do you want to have uh, good grades or do you want to learn primarily only or have good grades and learn? Uh, are, are they connected? And then the cost, how much effort, uh, time, uh, working hours, also some other resource you would uh, like to put as cost to this, your degree project. Okay, you could think about that. Uh, when I was emphasizing the decision making of a project manager being so important, and also this uh, last picture illustrated uh, the importance of making uh, pri uh, decisions of priorities and trades of between different project objectives. So the project manager's first task is to make decisions and keep uh, the project in the right rhythm and progressing. So there is no ta much time for making these decisions. They must be, the decision must be done uh, continuously when the kind of a problems or issues uh, pop up. So the second uh, task of a project manager is uh, to lead the project organization and manage the actual work on the project's uh, core. The third uh, task of a project manager is to protect and safeguard the project personnel and project organization from external disruptive factors and effects and provide a ideal working conditions for concentrating on the core of what the project is up to do. This task number four uh, is maybe partly connected uh, to this 
3. So uh, regarding this number 4, item number 4, uh, the project manager kind of uh, connects the project to the external environment. And uh, in this way, uh, the project manager does it by communicating and interacting uh, between the project and its external stakeholders. And mainly connected uh, to uh, agreeing about objectives or resourcing with the customer or with uh, some executives and, uh, and uh, well, reporting project progress. Uh, but of course, when I was referring uh, to this Sibelius monument and, and Eila Hiltunen, there can also be, and there always is in projects, there are uh, uh, opponents for the project. So there are uh, stakeholders that are kind of opposing uh, what uh, the project is about to do. And that is rather natural because the project is uh, doing a change and there is always uh, someone or, or some groups that uh, resist the change for one reason or another. Then the project manager must also uh, concentrate on uh, taking care of this uh, opponents in one way or another, uh, another. either by com communicating with them, that might be a very good strategy, but uh, sometimes uh, also by ignoring or blocking them out and not let them disturb the project. That is also a possibility. And uh, when it comes to stakeholders, uh, uh, well, I probably all already mentioned that uh, the stakeholder is an organization or uh, an individual uh, who can have an effect on the project or uh, for whom the project can ha uh, have an effect on. So uh, the definition of what is a stakeholder so is rather wide. It also includes uh, the project organization and the contractors and so and authorities that are supporting the project's progress and, and, and so on. Okay. Um, now about keeping our eyes fixed on the project completion and, uh, uh, and uh, looking uh, in the future and beyond and not on the rear view uh, mirror. So, uh, about this theme, we can illustrate that uh, with this kind of a picture. So, we are reporting deviations. And at the outset of the project, so before the project start, we have preset objectives at the project's co completion. So we have scope, cost, and time. So those are our objectives in the beginning. When we have an pro ongoing project and the project is kind of being executed for a while, there is a kind of a time now in the midst of the project execution. And, uh, and uh, it is, of course, important to know the st status of the project, but not focusing on uh, primarily on the current situation or not looking much to the rear view mirror of what we did, but rather producing estimates about the anticipated situation uh, at the project's completion. So scope, time and cost estimates at the project's completion. And in this way, we can have deviation reporting, uh, where we report the deviations at the point of time at the completion of the project. So we compare the objective and estimate at the completion of the project. And in this way, we can take corrective actions well in advance during the execution, because we are looking ahead at where we are going. So we can make still the corrective actions and uh, change what uh, there is to come. 
Now I have a very concrete example about this deviation reporting and it comes in this next slide. Uh, we have a project. The duration is 20 months. And we now are at the point of time at seven months time. So uh, this can be a project uh, or it can be a work breakdown structure element one VBS one. We are going to talk later about what is a kind of a uh, 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 work breakdown uh, uh, structure, uh, but really uh, uh, it doesn't matter whether we are talking about the whole project or, or, or its part only. Okay, now uh, we are making the deviation reporting. Uh, and we are making it at the seven months time uh, in the midst of the project execution. Uh, and the status from inception until time now uh, at seven months uh, time point is uh, uh, the following. The budget is 300 and the actual cost is 250. Okay. Um, it looks good. The actual cost is printed in uh, green color so uh, it's below the budget. I will animate the 300 now into the picture. And it's, it, it came here, uh, it's, it, it's here at time now in the cum cumulative curve. Okay, uh, but now uh, we are reporting uh, the status at the project's uh, completion. Also at the seven months uh, time point. And uh, we see that the uh, whole project's budget is uh, 1000. And the cost estimate at the completion is 1,500. Okay, that doesn't look anymore so good. So we have this red uh, color number 1,500 uh, against uh, this 1,000 budget. And I animate now the budget uh, also to the picture, cumulative picture, and it comes here. Okay, well, now... Uh, when we have uh, reported the status at the project completion, we can do these corrective actions early, well in advance, and, and we can still do something for the project. And what these corrective actions could be? We could uh, uh, go to the executive and uh, ask uh, for more money and uh, the need to change the project's budget and spend more time. Uh, spend more money, sorry, uh, for that. And uh, we can also negotiate, negotiate with the customer uh, whether the customer accepts, if this is a customer delivery project, whether the customer accepts this, what we plan to do, and uh, whether he can, they can accept the cost. But, of course, we can also reduce cost. But how we reduce cost? Definitely, we cannot... Uh, kind of a take a pen and strike this 1,500 over and uh, write 1,000 without doing anything. And I have this kind of an example. So if we are uh, planning and building in our project a uh, uh, motorboat <coughs> uh, with uh, a very special motorboat with two uh, external outboard motors, very fast one, uh, let's say, uh, that uh, in, in, in that way. So now that uh, we see that our cost uh, estimate is so high and we must reduce the cost radically, we must just take uh, the drawings and specifications of that boat uh, on the table and uh, kind of a uh, uh, strike the other motor away and uh, only make a boat with one motor. And maybe that is not that fast. Maybe with our whole family on board it even doesn't kind of uh, 
uh, race into kind of a fast modes at all. It just kind of a, uh, 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 drives uh, deep uh, on the subsurface uh, with th this one mode, but still we can get forward and so on. Not necessarily what we wanted from a boat, but uh, because the cost is the important issue, then we must uh, uh, so do something for, for the scope and uh, make that, that make not that ma magnificent uh, uh, project uh, outcome out of it. Okay, well, now about time and time factor in management. Uh, I think that already these previous discussions brought uh, the kind of a time and time factor issues up. Uh, but also this picture uh, tells about something uh, that expands maybe our perspective on uh, time with projects. So now the project life cycle is uh, here uh, drawn with phases uh, with red color. Uh, but there is also time uh, or phases before the project and uh, phases uh, after the project. And we could call this uh, system life cycle and we could argue that uh, project is only a part of system life cycle. So we have this uh, before the project phase and we have this after the project phase. And if we take this uh, uh, system life cycle uh, uh, picture on time uh, to this next picture here. We can see that at the bottom we have uh, here uh, the system life cycle with the same uh, red uh, project life cycle phases, but now we have uh, expanded uh, the uh, visually uh, the use or operations phase. Uh, over a longer time, uh, which is more nat natural way of describing because the project uh, end product is used for, for a long time. And uh, uh, we have here up in the picture, we have this kind of a uh, individual who is uh, looking the whole uh, system life cycle from a strategic perspective. And this can be an investing customer who is interested about the sustainability, not only in projects, but also, also in the uh, use of the system that comes out from the project. And uh, we also have their uh, kind of uh, illustrations of uh, investment calculation type of a uh, model where we have uh, the investment costs and the maintenance and operating costs, and then we have revenues so that we can, the customer is interested about the long-term uh, value of uh, the system uh, over the whole life of the system, of course. And then uh, at the lower uh, part, there is the kind of tactical perspective from a, a kind of a project contractor, uh, a supplier who has promised to deliver a certain kind of a system to the customer. Uh, and uh, uh, this contractor's uh, uh, planning horizon maybe is uh, the project phase, uh, execution uh, phase, and then maybe some uh, few months after it uh, for uh, being responsible for the guarantee of whether the uh, system works as uh, they have promised. And then there are, might be some more operational uh, people or organizations who are just concentrating on doing very well the uh, job that they are asked to do uh, or they are contracted for. Okay, uh, now that we had this kind of a perspective here uh, with this picture, we can take uh, up uh, the question of a customer's investment project and the project supplier's delivery project. And uh, I will illustrate in the next picture these as separate projects. 
So in the upper part, there is the investment project, which is the customer's perspective or a customer's project. And in the lower part, there is the uh, delivery project, which is the project supplier's perspective or the project supplier's project. And uh, uh, at certain phase, uh, the, uh, the supplier uh, makes a, uh, with the customer a, signs a contract from a customer's point of view that can be called order that the customer makes an order. Then uh, when the, we are at the completion of the project, there is the handover uh, of the seller and takeover of uh, the buyer. And uh, from this picture, uh, I have a kind of a class discussion. I derive a class discussion exercise. And uh, I have used this in class to uh, ask students the following question. And uh, I can ask this question from you now. And you can think about that, but I can also answer it uh, in a rather simple way. And you can, of course, uh, make a uh, uh, push uh, before I'm going to explain uh, what I think about this. You can then push later on uh, the pause uh, on of this uh, lecture video to kind of have that uh, video on hold for a while when, when you are thinking about this question. So the question is this why question in the middle uh, of this uh, slide. Why the customer and the supplier must both establish their own projects? And uh, thereby, why uh, the, custom, uh, the customer and supplier's projects must have their own project managers accordingly? So why is this? Well, um, at the upper part of this uh, picture, there is a kind of a uh, story that uh, what is the context of your buying uh, and, uh, and someone's selling that your family is the customer and you're buying a new house and uh, you contract it for a supplier who builds a, a house uh, on your land uh, based on your desires. And then there are the subsidiary questions A and B uh, that uh, what the customers uh, or buyers project managers should uh, concentrate on and what the suppliers uh, project managers sh should com concentrate on. But, uh, but now the question is that why the customer, uh, customers uh, and uh, suppliers projects must have their own project managers actually or own project organizations. And now I'm telling my uh, insights or my answer to this. Uh, the reason is that uh, both of these organizations, the customer and the supplier, have their own businesses. Uh, they understand better their own businesses and of, of course their uh, uh, goals and objectives are connected to what they try to reach with their businesses. And especially the customer should put its best resources, best people to uh, buy the project from the customer because the customer uh, really looks at the much uh, longer planning, over the much longer planning horizon. And uh, uh, customer uh, really can make uh, very, even very difficult trade of decisions uh, regarding different uh, objectives. So, for example, uh, the sustainability can be so important to the customer that customer is uh, willing to pay a uh, certain amount of money more. Or uh, it can be uh, that if we take, for example, uh, uh, certain characteristics of the house or if we would be uh, buying an IT system, the customer's representative can make decision that, okay, uh, we can do certain, uh, for example, recording works 
you know, IT system manually and we don't need a fully automated system because we don't want to pay too much, for example. Or in the family house, uh, you can have certain qualities and, and when you have several contrasting qualities uh, or objectives that certain uh, features, for example, cost so much more, the customer can make the decisions and profile uh, the uh, project so that uh, it will be good for the customer's business and customer's purpose. The supplier cannot do that. The supplier can, of course, promise that we can interview users and, uh, and, and we can uh, have a great feasibility study and, uh, and we can come up what uh, we think that we you should have and so on. But still, if the customer doesn't put very much attention and uh, its best resources to this, I think that uh, it might happen that the supplier, however well the supplier uh, interviews the customer's representatives, can uh, suggest uh, a house that doesn't necessarily fit so well to the customer's purpose. And the customer doesn't even recognize it because the customer has not the resources so much into the project and, and, and just accepts the supplier's great uh, uh, assuring uh, presentation that uh, we have interviewed uh, you and all, we have combined uh, all opinions of all users and so on and, and this is what you should have. Okay, the customer should uh, think themselves what they should have. Okay, mm -hmm. now we can expand this picture also from just having uh, this one single customers and one single supplier's project uh, side by side and the supplier is delivering the whole project to the customer. We can expand it with this picture where at the top there is the customer's investment project. But then there are several sub-projects that are uh, delivering uh, their uh, uh, sub-projects uh, sub-products uh, to certain parts of uh, the customer's uh, investment process. And uh, this is a kind of a project supply chain where uh, many firms participate with their projects. And when we go uh, towards down uh, part of this picture, towards the uh, uh, upstream uh, of the supply chain, so then there is only kind of a standard uh, component or, 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 or very simple service uh, providing uh, uh, suppliers, but uh, then in the middle there could be larger and larger uh, projects that, uh, that are bringing uh, big uh, uh, and, and significant parts of the customer's investment projects to the customer. If the customer is uh, serving as a systems integrator, but if it of course can also be that the customer gives the systems integrator's role to one single supplier and that makes the project and then uh, that supplier uses sub-suppliers then uh, for integrating the whole customer's investment together. Okay. Now we go into project marketing and sales. So we are talking about uh, selling projects and buying projects or sub projects. And uh, there are project deliveries every now and then uh, in a project suppliers. Uh, or project-based firms uh, uh, list of uh, deliveries to their customers. Uh, and uh, then there is project marketing and sales uh, for increasing uh, the project uh, or the possibility of further project opportunities in the future. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, this term project marketing and sales. Uh, this is a rather established term that we use both words marketing and sales. 
But in fact, uh, I can see that in many other contexts uh, there is a clear difference between marketing and sales. But uh, in projects, in sell selling and delivering projects business, uh, so uh, uh, the distinction between what is actually marketing and where the marketing ends and what is actually sales and where selling uh, starts. So that is not very uh, definitive that, uh, 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 let's say, limit there uh, and, uh, or boundary. Uh, and uh, therefore, I would prefer talking about selling, not so much about marketing, just to have this simple word to refer to this activity. Uh, but uh, if we think about uh, what is selling and what is marketing, so we can, for example, think about uh, uh, the supplier's representative going to a customer and the customer even doesn't know that they have a problem. But after talking a while, uh, a kind of a project uh, opportunity starts uh, folding up uh, gradually. So was that marketing or was it sales? And uh, when we finally end up to maybe delivering or bidding a project to the customer. Or another example, uh, when we are delivering a project to a certain customer, uh, we might have so good customer reference there that we can have future business with that or with some other customers uh, for the good reputation of that specific project. Was that project delivery, was it selling or marketing or, or what? Okay, uh, maybe these examples also tell a little bit about what uh, uh, project uh, marketing and sales is about. And it's about very much about uh, interaction with the customer and uh, very much about uh, relationships and relationship building uh, with uh, the customer. Now in this uh, picture, uh, we have uh, both the project uh, sellers uh, process uh, at the top of this picture and uh, the project buyers uh, perspective or process at the bottom of this picture. And uh, these are not in the time axis. Uh, in, in, made very uh, well in, in any time axis. And that's why I have tried to connect these two pictures uh, with these red arrows uh, that go across the bottom and uh, top pictures. So if we start from the bottom, there is, from the customer side, there's the opening of uh, competitive bidding. So uh, the Customer sends a request of bid, uh, for bid uh, to the supplier or a quote, uh, request for quotation. And the red arrow uh, goes from customers opening the competitive bidding to uh, the uh, supplier's uh, uh, point where the supplier uh, uh, identifies or starts identifying opportunities, opportunities to bid. And then uh, the suppliers decides whether uh, to participate into competitive bidding or not, whether to bid or not. And when perhaps the supplier bids, uh, then the bid comes uh, down uh, with this red arrow to uh, the buyer's uh, process uh, by, uh, to the point where there is the receiving of bids and then uh, the buyers thoughts uh, analyzing and comparing the bids and uh, maybe choosing a supplier or several suppliers and starting negotiations with and then coming up to end up to a com contract with one supplier. Okay. There are 
two different approaches of selling a project. I would say that this deterministic approach uh, very much reflects uh, the idea that was up in the previous uh, picture, in the previous slide. So it is about actively following uh, the markets and then uh, sending the bids for customers requests for bid. Uh, uh, request for bids and uh, this is rather reactive. When customers send out uh, request for bids, then we decide whether to bid or not. The constructivist approach is uh, more about analyzing customer situations and uh, uh, being kind of a well in advance discussing with the customers or following uh, whether the customers can have upcoming projects or, or project needs and contacting the customers and discussing with it, them. And uh, when the supplier discusses with the customer and, uh, and uh, develops maybe the offering, then that is also kind of an active influencing on the customer and on the potential rules of the game. So it is an active approach. And even if some supplier contacts the customer and, uh, and uh, discusses with the customer and suggests something, uh, that supplier can even have an impact on what the customer sends out as a request for bid if the customer wants to open a competitive bidding among several suppliers. And this one uh, supplier that has had possibility to uh, influence on the customer's uh, request for bid uh, can have some advantage uh, in the bidding competition from, from that. Okay, uh, then uh, factors that the project supplier uh, should consider when evaluating the customer's request for bid. So first is general criteria. The possibility to win the competitive bidding. So, which things affect uh, this possibility? Uh, I think that the customers, uh, well, first of all, the competitive situation. So, who are the competitors and how strong the competitors are? How strong position we have? in the market. Okay, that is one. But then also that uh, uh, what is the relationship of the customer with some other suppliers, our competitive suppliers, and that is also uh, maybe rather important thing. Then the second, the overall attractiveness of the project for the supplier. And when we are thinking about the attractiveness, uh, I think that uh, uh, it is very important also to find out who the customer is and what the project is. Of course we know maybe what we might be interested about and so on, but we must go to see the customer and meet the customer. Also if we are supplying a, a information system for the supplier, I think it's important to go to the customer and see the customer's headquarters, what kind of a uh, palace or, or a ghetto uh, uh, he's having uh, his office in and, and, and so on. Uh, I think that uh, knowing the customer and knowing the actual project and the context where the project is going to be delivered is, is rather important and there is not very many other uh, good uh, practices than, than to go and see and find out with your own eyes and uh, you can maybe get answers to many questions. It also is so that anyone can send out request for bid. It can, but it can be that someone could send a, a request for bid, some only one individual from a garage uh, for a nuclear power plant and uh, thereby also you must find out that uh, if the customer is a real customer for you or anyways real for anyone. Okay, then uh, 
factors to consider when making the decision the bid to bid. So first the nature of the bid. So what stage is the customer's investment project, uh, process in? So is it a binding bid or just a quotation or a budget quotation which is not binding? Then competitive situation attractiveness of request for bid uh, from business perspective and uh, for from technical perspective also the attractiveness. I think that these matters are explained in your material in the textbook and uh, in the lecture videos rather well. So this is a, a more or less a little bit of a list like of uh, things about f uh, few uh, issues that I want to emphasize. So uh, the sample of a typical bit content. So here I would maybe say only uh, something about this first item here. It's rather important to explain to the customer a summary of their expectations. That shows that you have been into what uh, their problem is that, and you are up to solving it. And you must also in that way check uh, that you have understood right what uh, the actual uh, customer's problem is. So it is important for the customer to see that uh, you are really uh, making a bid for them and for their situation. Then uh, there is some of these other items uh, and in the very end uh, there is this appendices and it's important to understand that there can be hundreds of pages of appendices and it is good also to use uh, this bit structure to put many things into appendices uh, to ensure uh, that uh, the most important uh, uh, issues in the bit are communicated in a rather concise way but still clearly to the customer and uh, and, and then there might be very many details uh, and, and also important things but but still the appendices can be used effectively to uh, have a kind of a certain profile or ethos for your bid. Then uh, what the customer's decision-making criteria are when they are selecting a supplier. So I would say that in your material uh, there, uh, these uh, issues, these items are explained more extensively. So the textbook and the videos. And uh, also that in your first group assignment uh, I think that you might benefit from looking at uh, chapter 3 in our uh, textbook and when there is the kind of a customer's uh, bit comparison uh, table where there is a comparison criteria for, for comparing uh, the bids. So uh, maybe you would find it useful when uh, making your first uh, group assignment and uh, do that of course you, you do that group assignment creatively and you can uh, then creatively uh, implement the ideas uh, of such, such table for example. Uh, you, you, you don't need to take it as is of course. Uh, then uh, one thing that I would like to uh, say here that if you are into this competitive bidding and uh, if the customer has sent out uh, the request for bid for you so uh, it's uh, important that you really bid according to what the customer expects you to uh, bid. Uh, so uh, bid, uh, make a bid that uh, is in accordance to customer's uh, requirements. But then if you have something, some completely different uh, to offer to the customer, make that as an option. So the option, in the option you can of course make complete another big bid where you say to the customer that of course we respect what you want from us and we bid it but then we have here an option that you can also choose uh, an alternative uh, and we think that this is a much better solution for your problem 
uh, at least we would appreciate if you would consider it. And that is the way to keep yourself in the competition. Uh, and when customer compares the different bits from competitors, so I think that uh, they might uh, uh, do that according to their own criteria in the first place. But uh, of course your option in this way, if it's provided in this way, it will then be taken into account. Okay, now contracts. Contracts are juridical documents, this item number one in this slide. So they are juridically binding and many times, uh, uh, well, mm, the legalistic or juridical perspective emphasizes the opposite interests of the parties. And many times uh, the lawyers, they are adding their, uh, for um, the benefit of their principles, they are adding their uh, safeguarding uh, clauses that safeguard the principle or limits uh, uh, the uh, liability uh, of the principle. And that is very important, of course, uh, that there are some limiting uh, clauses and, uh, and, and uh, you, you must, of course, take care of that when you are making a contract. However, in this uh, uh, item number two or point number two, uh, uh, the claim is that the contract can be also, also a document which clarifies mutual understanding. Uh, and uh, is a kind of a collaborative uh, statement in a way. Uh, so the contract can be seen as a memo or list of items and also some parts of the contract can be orally agreed. So uh, we refer here to relational contracting that emphasizes the flexibility and goodwill and there are in, in those kinds of contracts there might be very many statements like issues that we, uh, our aim is to uh, mutually agree and uh, support the, for the, the benefit of the project and not necessarily sub-optimize uh, uh, our own uh, firm's interest only. And, and then there is also a reference to alliance type of agreements which are agreements uh, uh, among several parties and uh, where all parties benefit if, if the project went good, went, goes well, but of course everybody participates in paying if, uh, if, if, if there are some uh, bills to be paid for uh, uh, deficient uh, performance. Then uh, at the lower part of this uh, slide, uh, so uh, there are some perspectives uh, to contracting between the buyer and seller. And uh, uh, first point is about transaction costs. Transaction costs means that uh, this whole contract and uh, delivery is a kind of a transaction when it's agreed with uh, between the buyer and the seller. And uh, when uh, the buyer makes the request for bid, it takes a lot of resources. Uh, when the supplier uh, prepares a bid, participates uh, in uh, negotiations, when the uh, customer, the buyer, uh, compares the bids and selects uh, those uh, suppliers that are invited to negotiations. And so this all takes a lot of uh, time and money. And also the del delivery period of that uh, uh, project product by the contractor that also needs both parties. Uh, the suppliers should follow, uh, accept the project uh, in parts maybe, uh, in installments where uh, uh, the, uh, the buyer accepts certain part of the project and pays some part of the, for example, fixed price to the supplier and, 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 and so on. So this is kind of a transactional and it uh, takes a lot of uh, uh, money to uh, do this all. So this is what transaction costs are referring to. Uh, 
Then previous relationships between the buyer and seller are important. And if trust has been built in those previous relationships, so it is much more easier to do future projects. Not everything uh, must be uh, written down to contracts and so on, so because the parties know uh, how they can work together and they can trust on it. And also expectations about the future project. That is also a very strong uh, connector between uh, certain companies or uh, project uh, in project deliveries when the suppliers, for example, expected more projects from the same customer. Or some references, uh, uh, good references from this customer and then uh, benefiting from some other customer buying from this same uh, contractor. Then there might be opportunistic behavior. Uh, it can be, for example, that the buyer has already uh, secretly decided uh, to select certain contractor to work for them. But arranges a competitive bidding competition uh, uh, among several suppliers to kind of squeeze the price down also for this pre-selected uh, supplier. And this is rather, well, this is a little bit unethical uh, thing and it uh, is kind of a misuse of other suppliers' uh, resources just to use them as kind of a rabbit to run uh, the selected one's price down. Uh, also, it can be that the supplier uh, who is always uh, favored by a certain uh, buyer can uh, price uh, its services or projects higher and higher uh, from project to project because they think that they are so important for this customer that they can and they must because uh, they are more valuable than others because uh, of the relationship. Uh, the fourth one in the very bottom uh, says that uh, the buy, uh, if the buyer tends to favor one uh, or few specific trusted suppliers, then this may have adverse implications on the long term uh, on the buyer, because uh, the other bidders probably wouldn't anymore like to bid and uh, it might even be that the uh, buyer might uh, miss some uh, opportunities uh, to innovations and so on with some new suppliers if they would like to select at some point of time some new and fresh suppliers to work for them. Okay. Now, uh, the title of this slide. The bid is initially a binding document. So I start with this item 4, seller's bid. The seller's bid is binding for the bid validity period which is expressed in the bid. So if the buyer thanks the seller for the bid and uh, if the buyer says uh, that uh, they place an order for the delivery in accordance to the bid content, so the contract is automatically established and confirmed uh, with, uh, by this buyer's order. So if the buyer says that it is okay and it places an order to the seller, then uh, the contract is formed automatically. So you must think if you are a seller so, and if you send out documents, uh, that are called bids, you must carefully think what you write in them. Because if it happens so that the buyer uh, buys as is, then the contract is there. Uh, however, then there is this last uh, bullet. If the buyer responds to the seller's bid by suggesting any change to anything in the seller's bid, even moving a comma to another place, then uh, this is interpreted as the buyer starting negotiating and uh, then this action or kind of a freeze 
uh, the seller uh, from uh, being bound uh, to this bit. So that is not anymore afterwards binding and they can negotiate, both parties can negotiate it as they want. So uh, then the rest uh, of all these items, one, two and three, it's, it's easy, they are not binding. So buyer's request for bid is not bind binding. Anyone can send a request for bid. Buyer's, buyer's request for bid budget quotation is not binding. And what is a budget quotation? Number three, seller's budget uh, quotation or uh, budgetary bid is not binding for the seller either. And uh, the budget quotation is kind of a rough estimate of the price delivered to the buyer for preliminary budget purposes with uh, rather uh, uh, inaccurate uh, initial uh, data uh, of, of making the bid. So it is just a budgetary uh, quotation uh, or budget quotation and, uh, and, and, and it is not, not binding for any of the parties, not for the seller or not for the buyer. Okay, now uh, some different or contrasting objectives of the buyer and seller. First of all, we must remember that the buyer and seller have their different businesses and uh, they see different benefits, they expect different benefits from the project and of course they are uh, uh, willing to make different sacrifices for the project. Uh, item number two, both the buyer and seller, they both have obligations that are defined in the contract. So we must remember that also the buyer has obligations. For example, obligations to deliver the initial data to the seller uh, at a certain point of time. And there also can be uh, penalties that are uh, defined in the contract for the buyer if uh, the buyer doesn't uh, provide the initial data. Or that the buyer uh, delivers uh, the electricity or water to the construction site to a certain point of time. And if there is delay, again, the buyer must uh, pay the penalties. Then uh, the claims, number three, are Im important uh, issues that we must understand that uh, sometimes uh, the, both parties are claiming or sending claims to other or reclaiming about uh, the other parties' actions and uh, asking for compensation maybe about that for the breach of contract and, and, and not uh, fulfilling the uh, obligations of the uh, contract or what was agreed and so on. So both parties can send uh, claims uh, to each other for certain purposes and also uh, ask or requ request for certain monetary compensation about uh, the other party's behavior. And this is many times uh, something that, uh, at least in some uh, countries abroad, uh, some uh, uh, well, the, the con both the suppliers and uh, and, uh, and buyers uh, are using lawyers for claiming uh, claiming back and forth. Uh, and when when one party claims and and. Uh, uh, sends some kind of request for a monetary compensation, then another party might claim for another issue and uh, uh, send uh, even a larger monetary compensation request back and, and so on. So uh, the fourth item here is, I think, rather important to understand that, that do always reply to any message uh, from the other party. So send a response. Uh, the content of your uh, reply can be many things. It can be that you don't say almost anything, but it's important that you are replying. For example, you can say that, okay, I have received your message. I uh, come back to you in two weeks time when I 
will find out uh, what how I should answer to you. And it's important in that way that if uh, there comes problems or it, there comes some kind of a, even some juridical processes afterwards and uh, and and uh, and fights between the parties. So uh, if you have not replied, it can be, be that the other party can say that okay, we have informed you and we have sent you this message and we interpreted that it is okay because you didn't bother to uh, respond to anything. And then that uh, claim might be strong from the other party, even though they might have done something that uh, is against, uh, in principle, against your will. Okay, uh, then a uh, logic of a project supplier firm of uh, having bids out there to certain customers and having projects, ongoing projects. And this picture uh, tells uh, the situation about uh, uh, the bids and projects uh, at week one and then uh, next uh, in the later phase in, for example, week n plus one on the right side. So first we have uh, bids uh, of cert worth certain value of euros and, and projects with certain uh, value. And uh, then in week one, we have new bids when we have uh, sent out new bids for new customers. Uh, then we have lost bids. Some customers did uh, select other suppliers. And then we have accepted bids, which customers have accepted. Then they turn from bids into uh, new projects. So uh, then we have also closed projects, which have been delivered to the customers and uh, then they, uh, we move them out from this kind of a project list. This is the kind of a logic how uh, we run the project delivery business in a way by bidding and uh, have, having uh, some of them uh, becoming projects. And of course there is this kind of a uh, measure that we call hit ratio what is the hit ratio, what, what percentage of bits turn into projects in the end, and how much we should put effort on, for example, bidding or selecting carefully who we bid for. Okay, now um, we are going into talking about risk and opportunity, and also as I said, I'm going to uh, take this up mainly because uh, I want to emphasize the favorable uh, side of risk or that risks can also be considered as favorable events, maybe sometimes called opportunities. There is a definition of risk. A risk is an event with a certain probability of realization that may affect the project's schedule, cost or scope. And this particular definition of risk uh, doesn't uh, uh, consider the unfavorable or favorable side uh, of risk. So it doesn't say that risk is, uh, whether the risk is favorable or unfavorable. And, uh, uh, therefore, uh, I want to emphasize the fact that in project management we must see that uh, risks can also be favorable. So that our management effort is concentrated not only on unfavorable uh, uh, events and uh, hedging against uh, their in impacts, but also taking advantage from uh, favorable events. Now uh, there is an illustration uh, of an estimate, cost estimate or risk estimate. Uh, for example, a chair that we might uh, build a very nice new design chair, for example. And we have uh, estimated its cost uh, as uh, with three monetary values. 
minimum 150 euros, most probable 250 euros and maximum 600 euros. Okay. In each of these outcomes uh, de described with this range, and we can consider that these are parameters of uh, skewed probability distribution. So uh, there are uh, certain events that happen in projects that lead these uh, outcomes to come true, either 150 or 600 or anything in between. And here we are talking about so-called business risks that cannot be typically that cannot be insured uh, in, 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 uh, against for in, in, in insurance companies, but uh, uh, they are more or less risks that can be uh, managed and are managed through our kind of a, uh, managerial uh, actions, and we can have an impact on what the outcome is. And because this estimate includes all possible outcomes in terms of cost, we have here the favorable events. They are in the kind of a low cost side if that happens to uh, come out. And we have unfavorable events in this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, higher cost side. And if we would just consider risks as, as unfavorable, then we would do everything in our project management to prevent the 600 and those events that lead to this six out, uh, 600 as coming out of coming true, and that would skew our project management activity to uh, safeguarding the project against uh, the bad, bad to happen, and then we would not concentra concentrate on. Ben, uh, taking advantage from the benefits and making really a good project and, and uh, uh, increasing the likelihood of these uh, favorable uh, things to happen, rather. Then when I was now talking about risk, I take up this concept of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty refers to knowledge or not knowing something, unknown. Uh, in other words, it can be considered, when we are looking at this picture, it can be considered as a kind of a, uh, uh, estimate error. Uh, and uh, we, in projects that are unique, we don't have necessarily uh, 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 frequencies uh, from uh, previous projects that are similar or that can be applied to this particular projects. So we can not use statistics necessarily, but we use uh, the expert opinions and uh, very knowledgeable experts of project team members or, or uh, some other experts. And therefore we use subjectivistic estimates. That means that we use uh, the uh, experts to uh, uh, give these kinds of uh, estimates about, for example, 150, uh, 250 and, and, and 600. And uh, in this way, this expert uh, includes in this estimate not only the variance that uh, might be uh, in the actual project, but also uh, the level of his knowledge or what he doesn't know. So there is uncertainty or not knowing uh, increasing the uh, variation in this estimate. And that's why uh, also the risk and uncertainty in projects, there is not so clear uh, kind of a distinction of uh, what in the operational sense or in practical sense is uh, risk and what is uncertainty. So we can say it in other words that risk estimates also include estimates about the level of knowledge or uncertainty. And in this way risk and uncertainty go hand in hand are, and are treated many times uh, as the kind of a same, same thing and probably this is also good that it, they should be treated as uh, op when, when you're talking about empirical operationalization, so as the same thing. Okay, 
Now we are uh, going uh, to talk about contracts as a tool for or tools for transferring and sharing risks. Now we are in this last items, item. And when we are sharing uh, risks, uh, I want to underline that we are sharing responsibilities. And if we transfer a risk to a supplier, that doesn't mean uh, that uh, that is a kind of a uh, unwanted uh, action to the supplier, but on the other, uh, well, but on the contrary, I would say that the supplier wants to take the responsibility and wants to make profit by supplying uh, uh, the uh, end product and uh, then wants to take those risks and manage those risks and uh, no, it, they know what uh, they are taking, what, what is the risk that they are taking. So uh, this picture uh, tells about uh, this transferring of risk. Uh, the title is the buyer's use of sell a seller as a risk buffer. And the upper picture uh, shows us a kind of a risk cloud, risk of doing the job and everything that is included in doing the job. And uh, it can be that the customer can bear the risk on its own. So the whole risk cloud hits the customer. If the customer can do the job, so the customer may want to do it and uh, take all the risks that are included. But then in the lower part of this picture, uh, the buyer has taken a seller as a risk buffer to do the job and absorb the risk cloud. And when the buyer does that, uh, they make a contract with the seller. There are terms, contract terms, and there is price for that the seller uh, wants uh, for uh, taking the risk and responsibility and doing the job. And then there are other contractual risks and problems that arise uh, based on uh, this uh, connection between the uh, buyer and uh, seller. And. Uh, uh, other, there is another smaller, maybe smaller risk cloud. And one example maybe could be that the seller could uh, go bankrupt and then uh, the buyer would be in problems uh, with, uh, with this. Uh, and uh, there might be some other uh, problems also. Uh, if the seller, for example, uh, commits to a fixed price contract and the buyer also initially wants to make this contract and they sign the contract and then if the buyer wants to change the scope of the fixed price contract it can be that the seller can charge a lot from the buyer as a kind of a compensation of now having some extra costs of having been prepared for this fixed price contract and now the buyer wants to have something else and so 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 you are kind of a married uh, to the seller and also all potential problems that come may come with the seller. Also, uh, if the seller does a low quality job and so on, you can end up to uh, lawsuits and, and, and something. So if, if, if you cannot agree and so on. So these are examples of the other types of uh, risks. So contractual risks and problems that arise from uh, making a contract with the seller. Now, uh, next I'm going to show you a continuum uh, about contract uh, types. And the two ends of the continuum are a fixed price contract and a cost plus contract. And then uh, in between I'm going to tell something about the fixed unis, unit price contract that is in between. But there are also other contract types in this continuum that I now show you. So. Uh, uh, the, in this conti uh, continuum, uh, you have the 
cost plus end and then you have uh, the fixed price end. If we look at the very uh, ends of this uh, continuum, at the upper part, uh, uh, upper end there is the cost plus percentage fee. This cost plus means that uh, the buyer uh, pays for the resources. For example, the buyer may pay 70 euros per hour for the contractor, for each hour that the contractor spends uh, on the customer's site, for example. So the customer has basically ordered a resource or resources from a contractor and the contractor just uh, uh, charges for all resources. Uh, then in this end uh, there is the statement that the customer has high risk and supplier has low risk. Uh, of course the customer has responsibility for those resources. He pays 70 euros for each man hour and uh, then he is responsible what they do. And if they do, don't do much, uh, so then it's, it's not a good thing. But uh, on the other side, the customer may want to have the flexibility because the customer may not have decided what kind of end product uh, he wants to have. And uh, he just, it, it might be beneficial for him just to have the resources and have the st job started and, uh, and uh, to, uh, during the execution or in the making, uh, he could also design and uh, make uh, his plans more detailed. Uh, the supplier has low risk. Uh, the supplier can charge for every resource uh, that uh, they allocate to uh, the customer. Then if we uh, look at the lower end, then there is the firm fixed price. The customer has low risk. Of course, uh, fixed price contracts are typically very well defined. Uh, uh, the scope of the project is uh, uh, de defined in detail. And uh, then the customer doesn't do, not need to do much. But the supplier has a high risk. That means that if the supplier uh, puts too much resources on this or if he had calculated wrong, uh, the fixed price, so then it might be that he cannot make much profit out of it and, uh, and, and then in this way the supplier uh, carries the risk there. Then fixed unit price, there in the red color in, in the middle of these uh, two ends, means that uh, uh, the buyer and seller have agreed certain fixed price on a completed unit of something. For example, on uh, uh, concrete foundations. So they can have agreed uh, a fixed unit price per uh, uh, each uh, cubic meter of uh, installed uh, foundations. And they are completed foundations. They are not just concrete as a kind of a mass of concrete, but uh, they have uh, needed to have the forms. Uh, they would uh, that that would have needed a lot of work to make the forms, make the kind of ironing uh, in the foundations and so on, pouring the concrete there and so on, and uh, to calculate. Uh, uh, a unit price for this completed uh, uh, foundation uh, based on uh, cubic meters and uh, calculating all the work that has been included in there. And in this way uh, the supplier carries uh, the price risk because he commits to unit, uh, fixed unit price, but the uh, buyer uh, then uh, carries the uh, quantity risk because it could be that they could have not uh, calculated in advance uh, how much uh, 
readily made uh, foundation work needed to be done. Because, for example, the size of the house was not known before they started the work or, so, or something like that. Okay, uh, then uh, about incentives or uh, penalties. Normally there are penalties in contracts. Uh, they motivate rather well to uh, deliver in time or deliver certain uh, uh, quality. Uh, and uh, just this cost plus percentage fee is there to uh, indicate to you that uh, if, for example, they agree to uh, pay uh, a kind of a uh, cost plus uh, co contract uh, based on, uh, on, on, on this uh, contract type, so it can be just 70 uh, euros uh, per hour, and uh, the buyer typically doesn't know what the percentage is. It, it's just a percentage that the supplier has used, but they, they come up to an agreed uh, hourly, uh, man-hour price, for example. But okay, about this uh, cost plus incentive fee there in, in the bottom. Uh, the incentive type of a contract could be, for example, by agreeing about 70 hours, 50 hours and 30 hours per hour, uh, and uh, being proportional to the use of resources. So both parties can agree that they aim uh, to 1000 hours uh, resource usage and uh, the customer pays uh, the supplier 70 hours per each uh, hour until uh, 1000 hours is reached, but then uh, the hours exceeding 1000 uh, the customer pays the supplier only 50 hours, uh, 50 euros per hour. And then if 1,100, 1,000 uh, hours are exceeded, then they might have agreed only 30 euros per hour, which even can be a kind of a, not any more profit, but uh, it can be even a kind of a deficit for uh, the supplier and uh, it motivates both parties to make uh, uh, the project uh, within a certain uh, number of hours, but uh, and, and and both are uh, motivated to uh, not not to exceed uh, the hours too much. Okay, uh, then uh, different contract types require different management efforts from the buyer. So. Uh, at the vertical axis, there is customers resourcing on managing the supplier's delivery. And uh, in the uh, horizontal axis, there is the same continuum of uh, contract types as we, that we've seen before in previous uh, pictures. And uh, we can see that in the cost plus type of a contract, uh, the customer must put most resources in managing the work. So the customer carries the risk and also has the resources there, 70 uh, euros per hour, but then the customer must also know what to do with these resources. However, it can be that this is very beneficial to the customer because the customer wants to keep the flexibility in the project and, uh, and uh, do some designing in the making and, uh, and, and in, uh, wants to uh, keep options free of uh, where to end up with the project end result. And in firm fixed price contract, so uh, that doesn't need much uh, managing from uh, the customer, so the supplier uh, delivers independently uh, the thing that is agreed in the fixed price contract and it is rather accurately agreed because fixed price contracts are not done uh, with uh, very ambiguous products or, or uh, scopes with uh, very big un uncertainty. Who could price that if we don't know what we deliver and what comes up so how can we put the fixed price there? Or at least, how can we put a fixed price there that the customer is willing to pay because the fixed price should be so high? 
Okay, now, uh, there is a kind of a, a connection between the timing of signing the contract and the price in a fixed price contract. And this also tells, if we look at this uh, uh, time, uh, time axis there, uh, this tells how important the level of detail in scope definition is in uh, uh, the fixed price contract. So uh, there is an optimal range of signing uh, the contract, so the contract price would be reasonable for the customer. But uh, if we do uh, sign the contract too early, before uh, the level of detail is much less than 75%, for example, or, or something uh, else. So the price gets higher uh, because uh, the inaccurately specified scope and the supplier wants to increase the cost uh, because of the risk for cost overruns or not making so much profit of promising uh, it uh, otherwise from, uh, for too low price. Uh, then, uh, also, if we uh, spend too much time on uh, detailing the scope definition and so on, so, so it might be that uh, the price gets higher uh, because of the tight schedule, because uh, the supplier now is uh, uh, putting uh, the increased risk of, uh, or risk of increased uh, delay uh, well, sorry, increased risk of delay, delay to the uh, price uh, when uh, the delivery time becomes uh, slower if we don't uh, sign the contract early enough. So, now uh, I have to you a multiple choice question. Uh, and uh, I show them in uh, the next uh, slide these uh, multiple choice uh, uh, alternatives and uh, you can think about uh, what you would uh, choose. I also tell my answers to you, uh, but you can uh, put the uh, lecture video on pause uh, if you want to think that for a while uh, before I then tell the results or tell what I think about uh, these things. And uh, the multiple choice question is about uh, uh, fixed price or cost plus contract. Which one we should uh, uh, choose? And we start with uh, uh, describing or understanding the initial situation of uh, where we are going to think about uh, this, this contract type issues. So you want to renovate an old house and you want to buy the whole renovation work by using one single contractor. Uh, so you are an owner of the project and you are buyer, buyer of the renovation project. So there is a lot of uncertainty with this renovation. There is not yet certain knowledge about which parts of the house uh, and its core structures must be renewed completely. And there is no knowledge either about which parts can be refurbished by having the existing structures repaired with cheaper conservation methods or whether you would need to use uh, more expensive methods. And new knowledge about the project scope will be accumulating continuously uh, during the project when old structures are gradually taken down and the condition of inner structures uh, are exposed for elaborate analysis. So, your problem is, should I buy the project by using a fixed price contract or a cost plus contract? This text here is the same as we looked in the previous slide. I just have compressed it with a very small font, but this is initial situation and there is your problem and so on. We looked at that already. And now the questions. Uh, in your opinion, which ones of the following statements are true? The statements are the following. First, the fixed price contract is not favorable choice for the buyer because the contractor could have put a high contract price for their delivery to cover all possible risks and unfavorable surprises. 
that the fixed price contract would transfer to the sole responsibility price uh, and, and, and thereby the cost that the buyer would incur with a fixed price contract could easily be much higher than what would be the case with a cost plus contract. So the fixed price contract is not a favorable choice for the buyer. Second, the cost plus contract is not a favorable choice for the buyer when compared to a fixed price contract because the cost plus contract makes the buyer to be the only responsible party that must carry all risks and all costs incurred that are connected to the renovation projects. So the cost plus contract is not favorable compared to the fixed price contract. Okay, number three. Now there is a little bit new knowledge. So now we get new information that in the beginning of the project both parties have signed a fixed price contract which both parties agree about but the scope of the fixed price contract covers only circa half of the scope of the whole project. And now the question is which half of the project was defined uh, well sorry uh, sorry Now the third option or third uh, statement is the following. Now we get new information that in the beginning of the project both parties have signed a fixed price contract which both parties agree about. But uh, the scope of the fixed price contract covers only circa half of the scope of the whole project. And this half of the project was defined in a great detail and both parties uh, agree about this definition uh, and the fixed price part of the project. Okay, now comes the statement. This fixed price contract on the half, half of the project is not favorable choice for the buyer when the whole renovation project scope is considered. Because the other half of the project could become rather expensive for the buyer as the contractor can use a fairly high prices for charging all other works exceeding this fixed price contract. So man hour prices and uh, hourly and daily prices for equipment and machines and so on. So which of these statements are true? Now I am telling your my, my, you my own uh, opinion and uh, so if you want to think for a while so you can stop the uh, video uh, playing now for a while uh, un before I say what I think about it. And this is, uh, these are my uh, cho choices about which statements are true. First of all, uh, the first statement uh, is true. Uh, because there is a lot of uncertainty and no one knows uh, what is the actual scope, there might be really big surprises. So uh, the supplier would price a fixed price contract too high to guarantee itself uh, a profitable project and I would say that the buyer would pay more in this uh, respect than what the actual risks would be because I think that uh, no supplier would like to take uh, risks uh, of selling with fixed price something that uh, that is not known. It is kind of like an open check to the uh, buyer in a way. Uh, and uh, when we take uh, the statement number two, uh, my uh, claim is that it is false. And the reasoning is the same than in the uh, statement number one that uh, the 
cost plus in a cost plus contract uh, the buyer would pay only for the work that comes up and is needed to be done not more of course he pays all the costs but uh, the buyer would pay all the costs anyways in any in, in any situation even in those fixed price contracts so if uh, a kind of a very uh, strange supplier would uh, price uh, the project with fixed price to very high uh, high price that, that no one would like to pay and, and the customer is uh, crazy enough to pay, uh, pay it then uh, the customer pays and also uh, if we go back to the statement number one so if the fixed price uh, contractor doesn't know what he does and it just uh, provides a fixed price that is too low fixed price then there will come other problems to the buyer for example the supplier would go bankrupt or the supplier would uh, start uh, kind of uh, uh, arguing and quarreling and, and then there would become some lawsuits because uh, uh, the supplier uh, is not knowledgeable about anything and uh, and and and, and uh, starts being very problematic for the buyer and and claiming something uh, that he shouldn't claim uh, uh, from the buyer now uh, number 3 statement number 3 can be true or false depending on how we see it when I was writing this uh, statement, I was first thinking uh, that, okay, it would be uh, true. Uh, uh, and, uh, but in second thoughts, uh, this is just, you can do a fixed price contract with half of the project and then you could use the same supplier and uh, pay for certain uh, uh, let's say um, price list uh, for the resources of course if you have not agreed for the price list uh, then you are in uh, trouble because you cannot use another contractor because uh, taking another contractor to this kind of a work on the same side would also uh, only uh, lead to some problems with interfaces and uh, and, and, and these uh, two suppliers fighting with each other. So you must use, use the same supplier, of course. Uh, but uh, in many times in fixed price contracts, there are also some kind of a price list for uh, actual excessive works uh, that the supplier must do. And in this way, this was just, uh, would just simply be a kind of a combination of a fixed price contract on the half of the project and then uh, uh, cost plus contract on the uncertain half of the project and, uh, and, and this can be true or false how, however we see it. Uh, what considerations I still have regarding this uh, third item? So many times it happens uh, that uh, when the customer doesn't know what the customer wants and uh, makes a fixed price contract uh, for the whole project with the contractor and the contractor might understand that the customer cannot uh, uh, make with this kind of a scope that he is now contracting that he must the customer must uh, order more and more work during the project then the contractor might calculate uh, the thing that uh, he offers the customer a rather uh, low fixed price to get the deal and then even though the fixed price is not very profitable for the uh, supplier then the supplier would uh, uh, then uh, charge for the excessive work and make the profit in that way because the supplier knows that the customer still needs something else and, and needs to expand its project and if the uh, customer needs to kind of a uh, change the fixed price part of the project that will become really uh, expensive for 
for the cust customer because then the supplier can claim that uh, okay uh, he needs a lot of they, the supplier needs a lot of compensations uh, for changing uh, his plans and everything that he has been so much prepared for. Okay. Now we are in the end of this lecture and uh, still uh, my question is that what did we learn? And having that question uh, expressed, uh, I show a little bit different list uh, uh, in, uh, in a slide than uh, what we had uh, the kind of a item list of which items we did uh, through, uh, through, but still uh, rather uh, similar. So if you want, uh, you can uh, look at these uh, um, points in this slide. I don't uh, anymore start uh, too much of repeating them. I think that uh, uh, we have rather uh, in a rather nice and uh, rich manner uh, gone through these uh, things. And uh, now with these words we are in the end. And I thank you very much for uh, being part of this uh, lecture, lecture number one, L O one, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you or you seeing me uh, in the further uh, lectures. So this is, was a ni nice time to spend, uh, spend uh, together with you and uh, all the best. See you in the next lectures. Thank you. Bye-bye.